so um, today I would like to tell you about uh, API testing with Refit and how we can write all kinds of API tests um, using this library and uh, also why uh, this may be useful to you on your project. But uh, I will start from uh, the beginning, from, from where I started. So um, it all started when uh, I was working on a project and uh, we were thinking of how to improve software quality. And um, I guess everyone agrees here that uh, one of the best ways to improve software quality is to test early and test often with automated testing. Uh, okay, but there are uh, many kinds of automated tests. And we started digging into that uh, to see how we can improve quality of our project. Um, uh, some person introduced uh, to us Postman um, uh, and uh, they said that we can do API testing with Postman. We can um, see what values our APIs return and uh, how they respond to different requests. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, then uh, another person told us that uh, we can also use uh, Apache JMeter uh, to write um, stress tests, right? To, to test uh, the upper limits of our application, what it can handle. And we also can write a lot of tests in JMeter to see how our app responds to, uh, to the usual load that we expect to have on our uh, production environment. And uh, OK, so we can uh, test our logic with Postman. We can uh, also test how fast our application responds with, with the correct answer, uh, but how fast it does it. And we also need to test uh, that it gives uh, these correct answers right, in a timely manner only to, to the authorized people. So we also need to include uh, some security testing, for example. Um, there is a great tool called Checkmarks uh, that's static uh, application security testing tool. And there is also uh, OWASP uh, Z attack proxy tool that's uh, more dynamic application security testing. And we thought, okay, cool. So using all those tools, we will um, make our app super stable, super secure uh, and great value. But for that, we need uh, people who have uh, expertise with those tools. Uh, that is, we, uh, we probably need a security expert to work with check marks or OWASP ZAP. And we also need um, ATQC engineers to work with uh, JMeter and Postman. Um, yeah, and uh, we also don't know how to do it ourselves. Um, and uh, we planned that, but then uh, this thing happens. That always happens, right? Uh, the deadline. So uh, we uh, we had a hard deadline that we couldn't postpone any longer, and we uh, saw that um, we have to do uh, we have to, we had to do about four months of work, but we had only two months for that. So really, uh, we had to uh, not spend our time writing tests and uh, onboarding new people to help us write tests. But we even had to uh, write our user stories faster, much faster. And um, so uh, we faced uh, this uh, very difficult decision to either deliver quality software with properly tested software, but late, um, or we could deliver buggy software, uh, but on time. Um, and um, this kind of choice uh, is called a dilemma. So that's a problem where there is no winner. No matter what you choose, you lose either way. Um, and so, um, but we were not satisfied with, with, uh, with that. So we wanted something better. We wanted to ship on time and uh, we wanted to ship quality software. So uh, we started looking uh, into what can uh, help us to do that. And uh, one thing that we noticed um, was uh, a thing called uh, refit. So uh, I'll talk briefly about that. So what is refit? 
uh, Rapid is uh, um, basically it's a, a library that it's um, type safe HTTP library. So it allows you to make uh, requests, but in a type safe manner. So here, um, by the way, can you see my uh, mouse pointer? Yes. Yeah, cool. Um, so for example, here you can see that we can make a request to user slash user ID. Uh, and we will get not like uh, an HTTP response with headers and body and that uh, all stuff. Uh, we will get a, a user object back. Uh, so this is really good. Um, and um, we already had this uh, thing in our project because we were working with external APIs that uh, we had to call in, in some way. Um, and uh, you might ask why uh, why refit? So uh, there are also um, there are many such tools available. Uh, for example, one of them is uh, REST Sharp. It's a very popular one. Um, so uh, that's uh, a comparison of what what a flow looks like in REST Sharp and in refit. So in REST Sharp, we um, have to call these methods like add URL segment, which basically adds a query parameter. And we also uh, get um, iREST response back. Uh, while uh, in refit, we uh, we just call it like a regular method without any uh, special handling of query uh, parameters or anything like that. Just API dot get and that's it. We are good. Uh, so that's why we uh, work with refit. And also, uh, by the way. Um, uh, those are two links. Uh, the first one on the left is um, a link to uh, a video that was released just um, on August 30th, I believe. So two days ago. Um, it's uh, from a YouTube channel, I'm Tim Corey. Uh, and it's about, <laughs> uh, it's an introduction to Refit. So it, it was a, a very timely video. So uh, I encourage you to go and uh, look at it uh, after the presentation. Um, I will open those uh, QR codes uh, later. Um, and uh, the second one uh, is a link to a GitHub repository where uh, somebody uh, compares refit with, uh, with REST Sharp and uh, other tools that they use for the same purpose. And so uh, you can follow that link and um, see what fits your needs. Uh, so obviously, uh, Every project has uh, something spe has some special sauce in it, right? So uh, your needs uh, might differ from mine. Um, so you can choose that for reference. Um, yeah. So uh, to sum that up, uh, refit is not in any way uh, related to to testing. It's just a tool to make HTTP calls. And so uh, let's get. Uh, to our main part of presentation, that is to, to our demo where I will show you uh, real code and how um, you can write tests using Refit. So uh, for that, we will need a, a project that we will test. Um, um, that's uh, the entry point of that project. Uh, that is a usual uh, web API, a SPNet core web API. So uh, absolutely nothing special here. Um, then we will have uh, our startup class. Um, I stripped down everything that uh, was unnecessary for the purpose of this presentation. So uh, we have uh, the bare minimum here. Uh, so we only have controllers, uh, a single uh, service that will uh, model our, uh, our application. And we also have uh, authentication with uh, a JSON Web Token so that we can show you how you can test authentication and uh, permissions and other security related, related things uh, with refit. And in configure, we also don't have anything, anything unusual. So um, one thing that I uh, added here for, for the purposes of presentation is uh, that simple um, authorization filter that will um, that will perform our authorization. 
All right. Uh, so we are using uh, authorization header that holds our uh, JSON web token. And uh, for the purpose of this demo, I didn't do uh, full fledged JSON web tokens. I just hard coded some strings so that uh, it will be obvious when we use which token. So here you can see that we check if uh, authorization header is not a secret admin. Uh, if it doesn't use a secret admin authentication token, then we forbid access to, to that endpoint. So only admins can, can call that endpoint. Uh, and uh, this is our single controller. So um, here we have two endpoints. Uh, we have um, a people controller, just, uh, just generic controller. Uh, without anything special. And um, we have this uh, endpoint to add new people. Uh, please notice that uh, it's HTTP POST request and that it, all, uh, it uses our authorization filter, which means that only admins can call that uh, endpoint and no one else can add new users. Um, we have uh, here uh, some uh, rudimentary form of um, error handling. Usually we would do that in a um, in an exception filter, but it would be too difficult for, for this demo. Uh, we can just see that uh, sometimes we, we can also get an um, exception out of this call. Um, and uh, the second endpoint is a usual get. So uh, notice we don't have uh, custom authorized attribute here, which means that anyone can call this endpoint. And uh, they pass in root uh, a request. So uh, it can be uh, of any complexity. Uh, in this demo, we have only one uh, parameter here in the request. But usually when we have, for example, um, let's say we are loading a page of some objects, we will have uh, a lot of parameters that can control uh, filtering and uh, in other ways can tune our query. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, we either find this uh, person that we were looking for or not, and we return uh, the proper response. Um, here you can see uh, data transfer objects that we use here. Uh, those two are already familiar to you. And the person, we just return um, the person without any special mapping. Uh, and also notice that I use uh, an UC sharp feature records, which uh, greatly help to uh, simplify our code. So here we can see only, we can in three lines of code define three data transfer objects, uh, which I think is really great. and. Uh, when we add on top of that, that records uh, provide us with um, syntactic sugar. For example, uh, we can use with close with them. Um, so I think they are just too good uh, not to use them. <laughs> okay, and uh, the guts of our application is that people service. So usually uh, in service, we would go to a database and store values there, but in this, in this case, we store them uh, in memory. Oops. Uh, in this case, we store them in memory. So we, uh, with that, we are just uh, simulating uh, our working of our database. And uh, we process to uh, these two commands. Uh, so here you can see that uh, we have uh, not only a uh, simple CRUD, but we also have some validation in our um, application and that was done on purpose so that we can um, test it later. So here, for example, we cannot add uh, two people with the same first and last names. Okay, let's move on. So uh, this was all about our application. Now let's get down to testing it. Give me just a second. Okay, cool. Um, so far, so good. Uh, so um, first, uh, we need to have some setup for uh, for tests to work. So uh, this is a helper method that will create our uh, commands so that they are not always the same. Um, 
And uh, here we go. This is a, a refit uh, interface. So uh, you can notice that we have uh, posts and get uh, attributes uh, and also body attributes. Uh, this is also from refit. So what they do, they um, tell refit how to send an HTTP request. So for example, this post tells that we need to send a, we need to use a post uh, HTTP verb and we need to uh, send a request to that path. And we will also have um, a payload in our request body. So if we, for, for any reason, wanted to send this command in, um, in say in path or in query parameters, we would just change this from body to query and, uh, and call it a day. Yeah, so it's that easy. And we get back uh, an integer, which is uh, an ID of a person that we created. Uh, and here, one, uh, one small thing, but it's very important, that um, here you can see we uh, pass an ID here. So if you remember, in our controller, we had uh, an endpoint that accepts um, uh, a request, right? Uh, but refit is, uh, it's not tied to your, uh, to your controllers in, in any way. So we can pass uh, these parameters however we want, and they will, they will be transformed into a usual HTTP request. So um, that's, by the way, also one, one benefit of using refit over, uh, for example, uh, automatically generated HTTP clients, because uh, you don't always have uh, an opportunity to create um, a Swagger configuration for, for a service that you are using. So sometimes it's uh, just a very old service uh, that you have no control over. And, um, and with refit, you can um, make calls to it quite easily. Um, so let's move on. And um, the next thing that we need is uh, a so-called API client. Basically, this is a collection of endpoints. So um, I have shown you uh, just one controller, IPeople uh, controller or IPeople API. But uh, of course, in a real application, you will have a lot of them. I mean, like hundreds. Uh, so here uh, I added some comments like I thin API, I another thin API. Uh, you would just add uh, those. Um, you would just add those um, new APIs here, and so you can call them from one place. And uh, this is our setup. So this API client is uh, making calls on behalf of somebody. So. Um, uh, let's say we want to make a call from on behalf of admin, then we will uh, configure that, uh, that API client with admin authentication token here. If we uh, want to make a call on behalf um, of an ordinary person, we would just use uh, their authentication token. So you can, uh, you don't necessarily have to have two roles, you can have as many of them as you want, you are just making a request uh, on behalf of somebody else using their authentication token. Um, and uh, that's uh, REST service uh, dot four. Uh, that's how you create um, a refit client that you can call later. Um, and uh, the last thing from our setup uh, that we need to uh, get up and running is uh, a base class for all our API tests where we uh, we will um, make a common setup. So for example, here we have a web app factory. Um, so uh, what we are gonna do, we will uh, start um, our application in process with tests and tests will send HTTP request uh, to to basically the same process. So it will be a proper HTTP request, but on the same machine and in the same process. Um, so uh, here you see, um, I have made two um, API clients. 
So admin API client will make requests as an admin and ordinary user will make requests as an ordinary user using, using their uh, JSON web token. Uh, here you can see the setup. Um, and uh, that's really all we need to start writing our tests. Uh, so uh, obviously all this setup, you will need to write only once uh, per project, only in the beginning. So uh, let's start with uh, performance tests. So um, what uh, we already talked about some of them. So for example, stress testing and load testing are types of performance tests. Um, what we can do in uh, our application we can uh, write a test as follows. Uh, we uh, will make the same uh, call to add a person, for example, um, some number of times, about a thousand or a hundred, it depends on how long it takes. Uh, but it, I mean, a big number of times so that we can collect uh, statistics about that. And uh, we store, um, we need a stopwatch, we measure how long it takes to make an HTTP call. And uh, then we uh, write it down to our table. And then we can uh, uh, make inference based on that. So uh, here uh, I check that uh, the max request time shouldn't be less than uh, 300 milliseconds and uh, that the average request time shouldn't, uh, be, uh, shouldn't be bigger than 10 seconds. So, uh, Basically, what we do with that, we uh, say that on average, our requests take uh, less than 10 uh, milliseconds, but there may be some outliers. Uh, for example, when um, garbage collection kicks in or something else, or we have uh, more stress on our system, we may have sometimes requests um, up to 300 milliseconds. So obviously that's not everything that you can do with that. You are free to do whatever you want with the statistics once you have collected that. So you can, for example, uh, also calculate percentiles. So you can uh, find a 95th percentile or a 99th percentile. So the, those are basically how, um, how much time does it take for 95% of our requests to complete. Um, yeah, and all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, so uh, compared to external tools, like we uh, were talking about JMeter, um, compared to that, um, these performance tests are easier to write. So you already saw that it's like, how long does it take? Maybe five minutes at most to write a performance test. Um, and it's super easy for developers because we already work with an unit or X unit. Um, and we don't need um, extra people for that. That's very important because you may not have a budget, for example, uh, for, for more people to hire, or you may not have uh, enough time to, uh, to find new people. Uh, but there are also uh, some drawbacks. So for example, that it's not quite real life. So um, obviously we are not testing it uh, on the same environment as we would do with a JMeter. Uh, so we are also not testing, for example, um, network latency to our data center. So um, also, yeah, so it's not quite in the same configuration as uh, it would be. Uh, and possibilities are uh, also limited by your imagination. Uh, but uh, this also means that they are limited, right? Because we won't invent everything ourselves. Um, uh, sorry, may I ask one question? Yep, yep sure. Why, why are you saying they are not real life? Why can't we make requests to real uh, service on our environments, QA or et cetera? Or what do you mean, but not real life? I didn't get that. Could you mm -hmm. please explain? Yeah, uh, sure. So uh, I mean that uh, those tests, uh, they allocated in, in a project uh, on every developer's machine. So uh, yes, we technically can uh, add, uh, we can point those tests to our uh, testing environment, for example, but uh, then people may start 
uh, starting those tests simultaneously, which means we will have two or three or who knows how many uh, test runs running concurrently, and we uh, won't get good results uh, because of that. But the same could, could happen with Jmeter. Several developers could run it simultaneously. Why are you expressing this as a difference yeah. to Jmeter? Yeah, so with Jmeter, um, usually we would have uh, a person, right? A one person who works with that uh, or who is performing uh, this testing. Or we would, um, even more, we would have it as a step in our uh, CI CD pipeline so that it's not performed manually. Uh, yeah, so that's why uh, I stated that it's not quite real life. Yeah, uh, I see a point. We can make it more real life. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, good. Um, so we dealt with that uh, with uh, the secure. Uh, we dealt with the performance tests, right? But we uh, had many more kinds of tests, right? Uh, so uh, let's um, let's get to security tests. So um, for that, uh, you have already seen that we have two um, API clients, admin API client and ordinary person API client. So uh, basically, what we need to do is we need to make uh, a call to add a person uh, just using different API clients. So uh, here you can see that I'm using admin API client and uh, then I expect that it shouldn't throw uh, any exception because admins can add new people, right? And um, if I'm using an ordinary user API client, so this is uh, the only difference between those two tests. Right, that I'm using admin API client and here I'm using ordinary user API client. So here I expect that it will throw an exception with uh, HTTP status forbidden because ordinary users cannot call this endpoint. They cannot add new people. And uh, if you have uh, more than two uh, roles, if you have uh, all sorts of admins and uh, other roles, or maybe you rely on more on permissions, uh, then you can um, do it the same way, just add more tests, or you can make, uh, for example, one test, uh, just use uh, different API clients uh, through the test case source in, in an unit, at least. So it scales quite good with uh, the number of roles. Um, yeah, and compared to uh, using external tools like OWASP ZAP and uh, check marks. Um, those are again, faster to, to write or to use than uh, OWASP ZAP, for example. And we don't need an expert who will uh, use that for us because uh, I think not that many people are familiar with uh, proper security testing using dedicated tools. Uh, and again, uh, the, the same thing that we had before, that it's easy to do for developers. Um, um, but there are also drawbacks that, uh, for example, uh, no automation available. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, I mean that <clears throat> uh, in, in such security testing tools, uh, dynamic application security testing tools, we um, can, uh, we have some uh, sorts of programs or presets uh, that we can set, uh, say that, okay, point this, uh, target this endpoint, and you can try to find an SQL injection in it, for example. And this tool uh, has a built-in program that will uh, try to find um, an SQL injection in a very smart and complicated ways. And uh, we also can target for other vulnerabilities like, um, for example, uh, cross-site scripting or whatnot, really. So uh, all those vulnerabilities, they are built into those external tools and we don't have anything built in here. If we want to have some something else, for example, uh, if you want to test for SQL injection, we would need to do that ourselves.
Okay, good. Thank you. And um, unit tests. So uh, unit tests are very different from what we had before because for performance tests and security tests, we compared our approach to um, to using other tools that might not be available due to uh, budget or time constraints uh, or just, for example, lack of knowledge in the organization, uh, right? So if we even have time or <laughs> and we have money to buy that, but we don't know what to do with that, so we, we won't be able to use that efficiently. But with unit tests, it's a different thing. So um, let's first take a look at uh, how we can um, substitute uh, unit testing with API testing, and then uh, when we should do that, when we shouldn't do that, and all that stuff. So um, as you remember, uh, we had, um, we had uh, a condition that we cannot add uh, the same person twice to our API. API. Uh, so uh, that would be an ideal uh, candidate for a unit test because it's a pure business logic. Uh, but here I would like to show you a, a different approach. So we can uh, test the same thing with uh, an API test. For example, here we test that we can add one person uh, but in the next test, we test that we, if we add a person and then we try to add the same person for the next, for the second time, we uh, unfortunately won't be able to do that. Um, so um, compared to, to real unit tests, this is, I argue that uh, this way they're easier to write because as you may have noticed, we didn't have to mock a, a thousand uh, services right because uh, well in this app it would be very easy but in real life we have services that uh, have many dependencies and mocking them especially mocking them in a, in a manner that uh, that would be proper right that uh, would that wouldn't violate uh, Liskov substitution principle uh, so that our mocks would work the same way as original worked it's, it may be very difficult. So we uh, would spend a lot of time on just mocking them. Um, they are also, uh, those API tests, they are easier to understand because again, we are not burying uh, the core of our tests under uh, all those mocks. Uh, they also uh, give you higher coverage for, I would say for free, uh, or in addition to what they also give you. Uh, because we are testing uh, the whole uh, request pipeline and not only one class. Uh, and they also produce less false positives. So um, with unit tests, we test that our class performs um, up to the speci specification. So, uh, but uh, let's imagine a situation where uh, one of our classes misbehaves. Uh, it doesn't uh, conform to the specification, but it, uh, for example, this method uh, may not be used in our application, uh, or uh, we may not, uh, we may never pass uh, such values to it so that it gives us wrong answer, right? So even though our class is uh, incorrect, right, because it sometimes gives incorrect answers, we will never see that in our application because we just don't use those methods. So that I would say false positive. So with unit tests, we would spend time fixing that while with application, uh, excuse me, with API test, uh, we won't notice that. But uh, there is uh, also a backside to that. So um, compared to unit tests, uh, those tests are much slower to run. So by much, I mean <laughs> like really much. Uh, so uh, for example, you can get up to like thousands of unit tests, no problem. Um, you will be able to work with that. Uh, but with uh, with API tests, even even one thousand of them, uh, it's it's really difficult. You need to have a beefy computer to to run them, um, and you can basically go for a coffee when you start testing. Mm. Yeah, so there is also a drawback. 
And uh, this is also a drawback. Uh, the thing about uh, less false positives uh, is that we have latent defects. So we don't have those defects in our application yet because we don't use that method, for example. But once someone uh, course calls this, me this method, uh, we will have a defect in that place and we could have prevented that with a, with a real unit test, okay? Uh, any questions about that so far? Okay, let's move on. Um, and um, next up is um, uh, flow tests. So we will have a, a, a recap at the end. So don't uh, don't worry about that. Uh, flow tests. Uh, what do I mean by flow tests? So uh, flow tests in is when you perform some business uh, flow in your application. So for example, here uh, I uh, I create a person, and then I uh, get this person and check that the data is correct. So um, when you create some object. Uh, for example, and then you uh, check it or update some values in it. Or for example, when you upload a video to YouTube and then go and watch it. So that's what we are testing. Um, and uh, that's very easy to do with API tests because uh, APIs, uh, they very closely resemble uh, our business domain. So um, we uh, usually don't have in APIs any strange uh, like services, uh, workers, managers, and so on. Uh, you know, those uh, crutches that we uh, add uh, because, uh, for, for technical reasons, right? So um, API is a clean thing that allows us to perform uh, actions as we do in our business. So that's why uh, writing flow tests in this manner is very easy. Um, and uh, once again, compared to, for example, um, Postman, so we could have done the, the same thing in Postman. Uh, I once again argue that it's faster to write because we are familiar with, with our testing framework uh, and with our tools and also with our libraries that we use. Uh, we don't need uh, QAs, for example. This can be done purely by developers and that's, that's very easy for them. And uh, once again, that's less versatile than um, testing with external tools because uh, they are those tools are external for reason because they are very big and complex and have many features built in. Um, so um, one more plus of writing tests in this manner is that you see we have all tests in one place. So uh, a developer can run tests in their IDE and see uh, that if they pass or not. So we don't have to go to Gmeter to check performance, then go to uh, another place to check security and so on. We can do that all in one place. And that's, yeah, that's very cool. So uh, to sum up, <clears throat> um, I think that uh, this way of writing tests is great short term. For example, when you uh, have a deadline that you need to meet or when you uh, um, don't have people uh, that can write other kinds of tests. Um, yeah, so when you, for some reason, cannot use external tools uh, or you don't have time to use them, you can uh, write tests in this manner. It's fast to write, easy to understand. Uh, they are all in one place and you basically don't need to buy anything or to hire anyone. Uh, but uh, because they are great in short term, there, is, uh, there always should be a trade-off, right? So if something is great short term, it may be not that cool long term. Um, so uh, one thing is that they are, uh, compared to unit tests, they are much slower to run. Uh, so um, as your test base grows, as your application grows, as your project grows, you will have more and more tests and it will take more and more time to run them. And at some point you will 
uh, have to either start uh, rewriting them. So it's basically a technical debt hidden in, in tests, not in your app, uh, but in tests. So you will either uh, have to start rewriting them to proper unit tests. Uh, that's, uh, by the way, what we did in our project. Um, so that they don't take so much time to, to run. Um, or you, um, you will have to start uh, throwing them away. Uh, for example, you may start throwing away all tests that haven't failed uh, for a long time, which probably means you don't change that part of code um, quite often, or it's very robust to change, so it won't have uh, that many defects in it. And uh, also the second thing is that um, those tests, they are uh, not a proper substitute for, for external tools because uh, they won't provide you a full suite of, um, of uh, coverage. They won't cover all scenarios. So if you have a very, an, let's say, if you have an application that's very security sensitive, right? Like a bank, for example, um, you can't really rely on those security tests. Uh, you should uh, you should hire a security professional. Um, yeah, if you have a very high load application, for example, the same thing. You should uh, start working with JMeter. But uh, as we know, not not all applications are mission critical. Not all of them uh, require top notch security. Uh, not all of them need to be uh, extra performant. So, um, and I think you have probably already guessed uh, what this means. So this slide demonstrates Pareto principle or also known as 2080 rule that 20% of efforts give you 80% of results. So those 20% of efforts, those are writing um, writing tests, writing security tests, writing performance tests uh, without uh, external tools as I have shown you today. So uh, those practices can give you 80% of results. And uh, most pro projects or uh, many projects won't need more than 80% really. So it will be enough for many of you. That's why I think that Refeed plus an unit. Well, in unit because in my example I used an unit, and of course you can use uh, x unit for that. It's equal slow. So uh, thank you. That's the end of my presentation. Uh, I'm ready to answer your questions.